Good morning, everybody. So I guess it's time to kick off. So welcome, everybody, to this flight tracking demonstration on event enabling APIs with a Solis event mesh. And my name is Richard Lawrence, and I'm a sales engineer working at Solis. And I'm joined here today with my colleague, Christian. Good morning, everyone. So let's get going. Um, so what we'll be showing today is an example of the event-driven architecture pattern for publishing and subscribing to live flight tracking telemetry data. Uh, but before we get into the demo, um, just a few slides to introduce what we mean by event-driven and how it's related to APIs. So APIs have evolved over the years from purely programming-based interfaces to what we commonly know today as RESTful APIs. However, we are now entering a new era where the term API is also being used not only for synchronous RESTful interactions, but also for asynchronous event-based interactions that are used in event-driven architectures. And even though EDA is a relatively new term, the event-driven pattern has actually been around uh, for quite a long time. Solace has been doing this now for, for over 20 years, uh, where it's been heavily used in the finance industry for use cases like market data distribution, for example. And now we are starting to see this pattern being adopted widely in many other industries and being an important part of most organizations' digital transformation projects. So how do we compare a RESTful API-led approach versus an event-driven approach, and when should we use one or the other? Well, firstly, from an architectural point of view, the interaction styles are quite different. With RESTful APIs, it's, it's what we call a synchronous request-reply style of interaction. So you make a request to call a RESTful API on a service, which returns information directly back to you. So you would typically use this style of interaction to request information when you need it. Whereas with event-driven, it's asynchronous push style of interaction. So you are given information when it happens. Um, and it's typically used to enable access to real-time data or frequently changing data. So looking a little deeper at some of the differences and pros and cons of each approach, with RESTful APIs, uh, you can usually call the API directly to get the information you want. So it's usually relatively straightforward to implement, and this is usually fine for accessing static data or data that doesn't change too frequently. However, for data that is changing more quickly, you end up having to keep polling the service to get the new data, which can become very inefficient and doesn't scale well for larger systems. Also, when calling a RESTful API, it's a blocking call, so it can be slow if it's a remote service. And then what happens if the API is down or there is a connectivity issue accessing the service, then you often end up having to implement additional retry logic to cope with those kinds of error scenarios. So with event driven, it, you are publishing information like a broadcast and you're handing over responsibility for delivering that information to a middleware platform like Solis, for example. So it provides looser coupling between your applications, which can give you greater agility and more scalability. So there is no need for polling for updates, as when information changes, those updates are automatically pushed to you in real time. Also, multiple recipients can receive the same updates all at the same time. And it uses the publish subscribe message pattern where applications can ask the middleware platform to receive specific events or to receive sets of related events through the use of topic-based subscriptions. So in summary, these patterns are quite different. However, they aren't mutually exclusive. And you don't decide to just use one or the other. In most cases, you will want to use a combination of both patterns in your architecture. And as you start to incorporate event-driven interactions in your designs, you'll want to start looking at event enabling your applications and providing asynchronous API options in addition to RESTful API options. Ideally, you'd want to do this with, within the application itself. However, in some cases, it may be easier to event enable an existing RESTful API using a small proxy service. And in this demo, we will be doing just that. We will be 
event enabling an existing, a, an existing RESTful API that's hosted by OpenSky to receive live aircraft tracking data. And then we're then going to publish this data out as real-time updates to an event mesh, which is then distributing the data to multiple users for display in web-based dashboards. And if you're not too familiar with the term event mesh, um, what exactly is an event mesh? Well, it, this is the runtime platform for an event-driven architecture. So it's the glue in the middle that is responsible for delivering your real-time events reliably and securely to all interested recipients. And this event mesh is composed of event brokers that are deployed across your enterprise, which can include multiple cloud regions, whether it's public or private cloud, or even your own on-prem data centers. And these event brokers are then all connected up to form a global event mesh, enabling all your applications to send and receive events irrespective of where they're deployed. And the event mesh will automatically and dynamically route events to wherever your applications are running. So we've implemented this demonstration using the Solis Pub Sub Plus Cloud Platform, which is a managed SaaS service. So, so that's the easiest way to deploy an event mesh, but there are other options and you can manage your own software deployments, or you can even install hardware appliances for extremely high performance use cases in your own data centers. Um, the Solis platform has many features, um, but this demonstration will show you just a small subset of the features, including a multi-cloud event mesh. In this case, it's a, it's a small event mesh that we've set up just connecting up two cloud regions, but it could be a much larger mesh spanning many more regions across your enterprise. We'll be seeing the PubSub message pattern. We'll be publishing events to topics that can be subscribed to by multiple consumers. Um, that Solis also supports other message patterns such as request reply and guaranteed message queuing, for example. Uh, we'll also be seeing kind of dynamic message routing, which is a, a key feature of the Solis platform that automatically manages how messages are routed across an event mesh. So data is only exported and delivered to regions where it needs to be consumed. Um, so this is great for optimizing performance and managing data transmission and cloud egress costs. We'll be seeing topic-based subscriptions and filtering. So we'll be looking at how we use topics in Solis for subscribing to events. And this can be done at a very fine granular level. So your applications are really pushed the information that they really need. Solus also supports a wide range of APIs and open protocols, um, and you can use these to connect to the event mesh. So this includes standards such as JMS, MQTT, AMQP, and also REST. And in this demo, we'll have a couple of Java-based microservices that will be using the Java API, and we'll be seeing a web-based dashboard that uses the JavaScript API. And we'll also be briefly introducing um, the Solis Cloud Console and Event Portal that you can use for designing your event-driven architecture and managing your event mesh. So in this diagram, yeah, you can see the architecture that we've actually set up for, for this flight tracking demonstration. Uh, we've set up a, a Solis uh, multi-cloud event mesh deployed across two cloud regions. Uh, we've got one service running in Azure in London on, on the right hand side at the top. And then the other one is running in AWS in US East. So this, this can support users that are based in Europe who can connect to their local service in London. And it would also support users in North America that could connect to their local service based in the US. You have a couple of uh, Java-based microservices shown here on the right-hand side. They are both running in our, in our lab in London. So these are connecting to the event mesh using the local London service. And these microservices, they're event producers. So they are acting as proxies to enable uh, a couple of public APIs, um, one from OpenSky that, that we're using to retrieve the flight, live flight tracking data. And there's another API that we're using from Amadeus um, that we are using for airline code lookups. And although these microservices, they're, they're still polling here, it's only being done once. So it's a lot more efficient and scalable uh, than if every user was polling the APIs directly. 
So the Solus platform is very efficient at how data is routed across the event mesh, and we only route events across the link there between the two services. If there is at least one subscriber um, for the information, so we're never routing information that's not required and, and will be discarded. And each event is only routed across the link once, and then it's fanned out locally to multiple, multiple consumers. So this type of architecture can support you know, many thousands of users all accessing the same data all at the same time. Um, you can imagine that you know, if, if many users all tried accessing, accessing the OpenSky API directly all at the same time, You'd soon, you'd soon start to hit a rate limitation, uh, which would cause your request to be very slow or, or be rejected. So unfortunately, we don't have time in this demonstration to show you, you know, how we set up all the event mesh from scratch, um, but it, it would you know, take 10, 15 minutes or so to deploy uh, a new service uh, running in, 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 in this case, we've got one running in London and the other one running in the US and to connect them up to form an event mesh. So here we can see a screenshot of, of what we've done through our cloud-based console. Um, and this is a central console that you can use to create and manage and monitor your event mesh. It's a screenshot as well from, from our cloud console that shows you some basic monitoring metrics, including message rates and the health of the service. In this case, it's showing information from the service that's running in Azure London. And here's another example of um, an advanced dashboard um, that, that we're using here in Datadog. And we use Datadog uh, to aggregate and collect all the metrics from all your services in your global event mesh. So this is all stored centrally uh, within Datadog and the data is all, all, all historical. So you can go back and see you know, trends over time. And this is a great tool for operational staff and it also supports alerting. Um, so they can be sent emails if there are any issues, you know, such as a message queue is growing and in danger of becoming full, for example. The Solus Cloud Platform also has a product called the Event Portal. And this is a great de designer tool that allows your model, allows you to model and visualize all of your event flows in your event-driven architecture. Um, and this is, this is important because we, with EDA, applications are, are more loosely coupled. Um, so it can sometimes be difficult to understand exactly what events are being used between your applications. So this allows you to easily visualize your event flows you know, within your architecture. So here we've got a screenshot of, of the event flows that we have for the demonstration. Um, the, the larger circles in, in, across the middle there, they represent the applications. So on the right-hand side, we've got um, the Open Sky Feed microservice, and that's generally being used to publish out events onto the event mesh. And the smaller greener green circles represent actual events. So you can see at the bottom there, one of the events that's being produced from that Open Sky feed microservice is the flight tracker plane update event. Um, there are also some other events that we will be using to trigger the microservice. So from the, from the flight tracker dashboard, we can actually send an event to trigger the microservice, which will start it polling and start it producing events. And then on the left-hand side, we've also got an airline code lookup service. Um, that we can use to perform airline lookups given a, an airline code. That service will go to the MDS uh, API, retrieve a description of the airline, and that will then get published out as an event back onto the event mesh. Um, the event portal also has an event cataloging capability where you can also define all of your events and their associated schemas. Uh, and that gives all your architects and developers uh, a single place to go to document, discover, and share all the events within your organization. So just a quick look at um, the, the public APIs that we're using in the demonstration. So as we mentioned, we're using one from OpenSky. Um, and this is a REST API that allows you to retrieve live airspace information. 
uh, including all flights for a given area, all flights given for a given time in interval, or flights for a given aircraft, and also arrive and departures by airport. <clears throat> So what we'll be using in this demonstration is, is the first one. So we'll be actually retrieving flights um, that are over the UK. So this is the example query that we'll be using um, that, the, <clears throat> that the microservice will be calling the API to retrieve uh, all flight current flights over the UK. So this will typically give us back around sort of 200 flights or so. We'll see how many we get. But typically it's around sort of 200 flights uh, any, at any one time over the UK airspace. So this will come back as a consolidated response when we query the API and we'll get back um, a single response, consolidated response with all the current positional information of all the aircraft currently over the UK. And then what we'll, we'll so this is some of the information that we get back per, per, per aircraft. Just so we're using some of this information in the demo, not all of it, but the first one is uh, an ICAO uh, code, which is a 24-bit address that represents the, the actual aircraft itself. So every aircraft has a unique ID. Um, the call sign, that's that's the flight code representing that, that actual the airline and that particular flight. Uh, we'll also be looking at, obviously, latitude and longitude, its position, its altitude, uh, and its speed, and its, and its track or direction. So when we get that response back from the API, we'll be <coughs> processing that within, within that microservice, and then we'll be basically event enabling that information. So we'll be publishing out an event uh, onto the event mesh for every flight that we get back. So we'll be doing that um, in the form of a, a public publication to the event mesh, and we'll attach a, a topic to that message, to each message for every flight. And the topic, um, the topic will take the form of a hierarchical string. It will begin with, with flight tracker that represents this demonstration. Um, the next part to the hierarchy is, is plane. So this represents an event to do with the plane. It's an update event. Um, the next part is the source of inf information. In this case, it's going to be OS that, to representing open sky. And then at the end of the topic, there'll be the flight code. Um, so every obviously every message will have a a different topic for for different flights. So in this case, on the on the right hand side, we can see an example. Um, the actual content of the message will be uh, in JSON. So hex is the uh, unique code for for the flight. Um, flight is the is the flight code. So this is an AAL two three nine. So that's that would represent uh, American Airlines flight two three nine. It's latitude and longitude, track, altitude, and speed. So then on the subscribing side, uh, we will be displaying uh, the events uh, graphically within a dashboard and mapping them onto Google Maps. Um, and that application will be subscribing to these topics um, to receive all the events uh, across the event mesh for every flight. And on the subscription side, we can use uh, wildcards so that we can subscribe to, to multiple events based on the top hierarchy. So there's a couple of examples here that to show you the kind of thing that we'll be doing in the demonstration. So the first one would, would, where we've got stars at the end, that would receive all plane update events for every source for every flight. And then the second example is showing you where we've got AAL star at the end of the topic. So this would match to all American airline flights, for example. So that subscription would only return events based um, for American airline flights. And we'll be showing you some other examples of that as well in the demonstration. The other, the other API that we're going to be using is one from Amadeus that returns um, an airline description for the given airline code. So um, shows you an example here where we've, we've got a response back for, for British Airways. So if, if we call the service given the the ICAO code for, for the airline, which is BAW, uh, we'll get back a description for, for that airline. And then we'll publish that out as well on the event mesh. So we've got a couple of topics that here where they're using one to request uh, a lookup and the other one, when we get a lookup response, we'll publish the result back onto a result topic. 
Right, okay, um, let's get on to the demo. So I'm going to switch windows and maybe Christian, if there are any questions yet in the chat, maybe it's a good time to see if we can answer a couple of those while I'm switching windows. Um, yeah, no, so I kept an eye on the chat. There was one question about whether Datadog is included in this, and I answered that as um, maybe you can add a bit more detail. So Datadog is a service that solves the platform uses in the background um, for monitoring purposes. So all these brokers that Richard was showing that get deployed, um, obviously you want to monitor the health of the system overall, and uh, you can have dashboards in Datadog um, that show you exactly like uh, all the very relevant metrics for these services, so uh, you know that they are working fine. Great, thanks. Okay, if you do have questions yet, yeah, feel free just to put them in the chat and we'll get back to them. Um, but now we'll kick off the demo itself. So hopefully you can see my screen now where we've got uh, Google Maps showing. So this is the web-based dashboard. Um, so we're showing here uh, Google Map of, of the UK. Um, now at the, top, at the top of the window here, we've got some connectivity information. So the top line here, um, I can connect to the event mesh and I can connect to you know, either of the services running event mesh, we can we can switch those around here. So I can connect either to the one in London, Azure London, or I could also connect to the one in US East. Doesn't really matter which one I connect to. Um, obviously, I'm located in the UK, so it kind of makes more sense for me to connect to my local one, which which would be in London. Otherwise, events would be being passed remotely across across the Atlantic, which probably wouldn't be the best and the fish, most efficient way. So. Generally, you'd connect to your to your local broker. Um, so I can connect into that broker, um, and now I can also subscribe to to two topics. So what I'll start with is the the wildcard topic, which is a star for the for the Open Sky source, and then star at the end for every flight. So so when we kick off the demo, this will be subscribing to to all flights. Um, so we'll start to see flights appearing uh, in Google Maps. And what I've got on the right hand side here is a button here, which will, when I click start, that'll actually send an event um, from, from the browser, so into the event mesh um, to kick off the, the microservice, which will then start polling the Open Sky feed and then start publishing the data out. And then uh, as that data gets published, we'll see it um, come into the dashboard. Um, and <clears throat> Christian can also do this at the same time. So let's kick it off and we'll start to see some events come in. So we can see here as events come in, that the last event is printed at the top. Um, we can see it, we can see obviously planes coming in. So each 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 of these represents uh, a current flight over the UK. I can click on a, a selected flight. On the right hand side, I can see information about, about that flight. Um, I can see it, its airline, I can see it, its hex address, I can see its current altitude, speed, direction. The top, at the top of the right hand here, I can see uh, an indication of the current message rate. So these are, this represents the, all the events that are coming in into the dashboard directly from the event mesh. Um, what you can also do is if you want to also participate in this and there's a QR code here if you want to snap that with your phone um, what what you what you'll be able to see is the airline code lookup so as we start to do uh, airline code lookups when I click on on looking up this airline codes so this one begins with SZS I'm not sure what that is when I click here it will send an event to the airline code lookups microservice which will then look up the airline through MDS and then publish a result back. That one's still pending. It looks like there are some, some airlines that don't work for some reason, but let's do another one, UPS. Okay, so that is United Parcel Service. So if anyone has snapped that QR code, um, what you'll see here is a kind of subset of, of this display. You'll just see the, the airline code lookups as they come back. Um, it's not really practical to show the, 
the whole display in, 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 a, in a phone, but, but you'll be able to see the airline code lookups get published back to, back to, your, back to your phone as we do them. So uh, Christian's probably also running this in the background as well himself. So he's just done a couple of look, lookups, one for Etihad, one for Eurowings. So anyone else running this on their phone would be able to see those uh, publications getting sent out across the event mesh to you. And yeah, that, your... uh, that's a very nice demonstration of the pop up mechanism of this in the background. Um, so rather than having a one-to-one -one communication with the backend server, um, this data is actually pushed out to everyone that is, is subscribed to this, right? So as Richard was doing his lookups, I would see them in my browser. And as I'm doing the lookups, Richard is seeing the results coming in as well. And so, so would you if you're uh, connected to this via the mobile app. So got a few yeah. more there. Yeah. Yeah. And you can see you can see in your window if you're running this, you can see the topic that you're that you're subscribing to for, for the airline code lookups. Um, so in your case, you're you'll be subscribing to a flight tracker topic um, slash airline slash lookup slash result. So that's that's the topic that's being used to publish back out uh, these airline code lookup requests across the event mesh that you'll be receiving directly into your into the browser running on your phone. Right, so what else can we show you? So <clears throat> let's go back to our, our topic. And as I said, at the moment, we're subscribing to, to all flights uh, in the UK, all flight codes. So if we wanted to just subscribe to British Airways, for example, if I do BAW that represents the the, the code for British Airways, if I then do BAW star, then we'll be subscribing to flight codes that begin with BAW. So I'll be basically receiving events just for British Airways planes. So now obviously I've got a much smaller subset of events that are being delivered into, into my browser. So all of these flights now will all have a, just have a BAW airline code associated with them. So I'm only seeing events now for British Airways flights. And if I wanted to go even further and just receive flights for one particular air, air, aircraft, I do 6BA675, for example. So now I'm subscribed to a specific topic just for a single aircraft. So I'm only receiving events for BAW675. Yeah, maybe to add on, on that, Richard, the, mm. the filtering is actually being done on the broker side. So the browsers are just submitting that subscription change to the broker and the broker is doing all the filtering. So it uh, stops your client from overwhelmed by receiving too much data in case you were to subscribe to something um, that would give you like lots and lots of data. Um, and that is being used in market data use cases, for example, where you don't want like all the um, data that is changing, you're specifically zooming in on specific parts and it's also fully dynamic. So as, as Richard is showing like you can change this um, on any part of this um, topic and it's it's a fully dynamic uh, topic tree that is actually being published in the background. So you can adjust your filtering to any of the fields that are available in the topic space. So if I go back to subscribing to all aircraft, now obviously my message rates going up now, I'm receiving a lot more events for, for all flights. In case you're wondering what the, the color of the, the the aircraft represents, it it's actually it's it's altitude. So um, flights that are a higher altitude tend to be kind of a blue blue sort of color. Um, green is a little bit a bit, little bit lower, and then as they get lower, they turn sort of orange, uh, yellow, and orange. So. So these ones here look like they're they're kind of descending and they're sort of going into probably landing into Heathrow Airport. So this one will be going down. It's at sixteen hundred feet. 
this one looks like it's going into into Heathrow and it's probably be landing very shortly and then after it's landed obviously okay now it's it's probably landing yet it will disappear off the display so as we as we stop to receive events from an aircraft after after 10 seconds if we don't get an update for the flight for 10 seconds then it's removed automatically removed from from the display Right, so Christian, any other questions that we can answer? Um, no, I don't, I don't see any questions in the chat, but please feel free to pop your questions in the chat if you like. Oh, there's one coming in. So the question by, coming from Yuha is, how frequently are you polling the background services? Also, you said the filtering is happening in the mesh and how much data are you fetching? Can you answer that, Richard? Sure, yes. Um, so yeah we're polling the you know these apis at the moment fairly frequently because you know obviously we want we want to see live information i mean ideally you know we, it would be better if those apis can publish events out directly as you know as updates uh, are occurring um but for this demonstration yeah we're kind of event enabling an ex existing apis so we are polling um every every few seconds every two or three seconds we're we're, we're doing a poll retrieving information and publishing out the updates. Um, but we, we sometimes do get throttled at sometimes, obviously if the API is busy, if other people are hitting the API at the same time, we could get throttled and it could, it could, it could be slower. But obviously with, as we said, you know, during the introduction, you know, with this type of architecture, we can, you know, we can support many thousands of, of, of applications all receiving the same information. Whereas if they were all hitting, the API directly, um, then you'd definitely start to see some some throttling from the API itself. Yeah, so we're, as, as Richard said, we're bridging the world between synchronous and asynchronous APIs here, right? Because the open sky feed is, is a classical RESTful API uh, that you have to pull. Um, and the actual like displays that we're showing here, they're connected to Solace brokers using the asynchronous API basically that we created. So the actual data that is being pushed out is, is fairly small, but the more planes you have on this and the faster you pull the synchronous APIs, the more events you create on the asynchronous side here. Ideally, it would be best if, if Open Sky Feed um, would actually publish an asynchronous API where they push the data as it changes rather than us having to pull for changes. Um, but that's just how, how these, these services are being built. Um, what we have kind of built here kind of gives you extra value for scalability, right? As Richard said, if, if a lot of people connect to the open sky feed and, and synchronously poll for these updates, the more people poll, the, the, the more stress that creates on the API for, of open sky feed. But actually having reduced this to one polling service, you can now connect as many downstream clients as you like as the data gets fanned out, everyone receives the data at the same time. And uh, you can now scale the same architecture to many, many thousands of clients if you want to. So the, the main difference really is like when you have data that is changing at times that is maybe quite frequent or less predictable, then this, this push architecture that, that you achieve here with asynchronous APIs has, has its advantages because you, you no longer have to constantly ask, like, has the data changed? Has the data changed? Has the data changed? And I kind of like do this, like uh, the, the faster you pull, the more stress to the system, right? Um, so instead of doing that from the side that where you don't know how, how often the data change, you're actually like changing this around to telling the the service that it knows when the data has changed to push the data. It's like the model view controller uh, when it pattern in when you're in your programming, right? You you don't want the the view to constantly check the model as it's changing. What you really want is like this is a callback to tell the mod to tell the view to update itself when the data has changed, and that's basically what we're doing here. So we're taking this model view controller pattern in a way to 
a distributed system that can now stretch data centers and uh, be distributed across the globe even. And um, the Solace brokers are ultimately the data transport mechanism that transports the data um, more efficiently and it allows for these filtering capabilities. So I think we have one other question here. Uh, so where are those Java microservices, services, the open sky feed and the airline lookup running? Right, yeah. So in this case, they're actually running in our, our lab in London. So we have a, a London office where we have a, a lab set up with some servers um, and they're deployed there and, and they're connecting from there out to um, the, the Solace event mesh, um, they're connecting to the, the, the service that's running in, in London. So that's a kind of a fairly local connection. You know, but obviously, you know, with a global event mesh, if you have a, an event mesh that's deployed spanning multiple regions, potentially globally, um, you would, you know, you could have microservices that are running anywhere, right? So you know, if you had a service, you know, running in, in the US, um, you could have microservices running in the US that are also contributing data to the same event mesh. And it doesn't matter where your clients, your subscribing clients are located, they could be located in a completely different region across the other side of the world. Um, they would just connect to their local service to connect to the event mesh and that information would all get routed across, across the event mesh for you dynamically. Great, so I think that's it for the demonstration. If there's any other last questions, we can answer them otherwise. Thanks very much for joining. I um, hope you enjoyed the demonstration. I got one more thing I'd like to add, Richard. Sure, um, go ahead. As we're summarizing this up. So um, as Richard said, like you could connect your microservices to the event mesh and um, you can kind of go anywhere in the world. So um what what the aspect that allows you to do that is is that you're decoupling your applications at your services so rather than connecting them point to point to each other when you're calling an api you need to know where that api is the url and the the path to the that you're calling right instead of doing that you're, you're connecting to a broker and the other service you may not even know where that is running so you can move this around because the brokers will will deal the part as part of the event mesh to route these requests mm -hmm. to the location where the service is connected and that that's a really strong aspect of this architecture um, which allows you to be more agile in your application deployments as well i think there's one more question um, that we can maybe answer so you has asking how do you see the async event driven api landscape developing will there be an http of async apis do you want to take a step at that richard sure i'll have a quick a quick go at that and then maybe you can you can also try and answer um so i mean definitely it's becoming more and more popular and we're seeing this with you know more and more of our customers who are starting to adopt you know this asynchronous approach uh, and an event driven approach um, and there are standards developing around it as well. There, there's a specification called Async API that you, you can you can go and look up. Um, and there are you know various standard protocols as as we mentioned that you know Solace supports that are more event driven. So you know, things like MQTT, for example, AMQP, these kind of standard open protocols uh, do support more of an event driven type style of interaction. So it's definitely becoming more and more popular and more more in use for for architectures that we're starting to see in 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 many different industries now anything to add yeah to? yeah no that was a very good explanation I, maybe one thing i can add is here that aside from like the open protocols that we see in the messaging space being amqp and mqtt um solis also has a restful interface and the most um, kind of like direct translation of, of, of how you can do like an asynchronous call or uh, like callback from a message broker is basically a webhook. And that's also what can be used with Solus brokers. So you can register a, a you can set up a webhook to get data pushed to you as a web service um, if you want to receive it asynchronously as the data arrives. So that's um, another good capability that you can use to bridge like the synchronous and asynchronous world um, and restful and non-restful APIs with each other. 
All right. That's, that's, that's it. That's then. it. I think we've run out of time. Yep. Yeah. Thanks very much, Christian, and thanks everyone for joining. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, everyone. I hope you found this useful and uh, see you in the API days. <laughs>